Welcome back to Proverbs 31 Life. Today, we are talking about being a servant. When this word typically doesn't carry um, something good. When you think of being a servant, most people say, I don't want to be a servant. Like, that's, that's low. That's derogatory. Um, and I would agree because the Greek word for this is doulos. And that word is the same as being a slave. And that is to be under the rule of or the authority of someone else. In our society, we use the word, um, the words like never carries a positive meaning. We This isn't a word we really use anymore. And we've done, especially as a nation, all we can to eradicate slavery, promote equality, and convince everyone that they are equal and deserve the best. That no one should be below anyone else. But we've missed, construed that word and we've taken it way out of context there is a time to be a servant especially for the child of God so let's go back to scripture and see what God has to say Romans 1 1 Paul a servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God Paul is the author of Romans um and that's how he introduces himself. If you go to Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Titus 1.1, 1, 1, he also refers to himself as a servant. In Philemon, verse 1, he calls himself a prisoner of Jesus. Paul was not a prideful man. He did not seek um, position or prestige. He even said of all the sinners, like, I am the chief of sinners. Like, he did not use his apostleship for personal gain. He said, you know, I'm pressing toward the mark of the calling of high, of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Like, nothing else mattered. He said that everything else he counts as but dung, it did not matter. The only thing that mattered to Paul was seeing people saved, was obeying the Lord, doing what God wanted, and getting the gospel to go as far as it could. And that's what he did. He penned over half the New Testament, but he still says... I'm a servant, I'm a slave, I'm a prisoner of God, of Christ. He had a miraculous encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Then he spent three years personally with Jesus in the desert after his conversion. And that's how he became an apostle. He had, for himself, he saw the risen Lord. That was a requirement to be an apostle. He performed miracles, preached the gospel to thousands, memorized the Pentateuch because he was a Pharisee first, started several churches and suffered more persecution than we can even imagine. But he didn't go through all of that for his own gain. He didn't tell us that those things happened for his own gain. He said, he basically used all the bad things and said, even though this has happened, I'm still going to follow Christ and you can too. It was for our example, okay? He had quite a resume, Still, he refers to himself as a servant. God didn't call him that. Paul called himself that. That's how he wanted to be known and identified. He was not ashamed to be thought of this way. He sought to live by God's will rather than his own. And if anyone had something to boast about, it was Paul. But he didn't. Being a servant takes humility. Christ is our example for that. And then he has given us others. Paul, David... So many in scripture that show us it's not about us. And when we are seeking to climb that corporate ladder, whatever it is, church, we want to be recognized. We want people to know what we did. We want, we want to thank you from the pulpit, whatever it is. That's pride. And pride will never let you serve. When you are serving for recognition, you're not serving. You might as well just give it up and go home. Being a servant means being humble. It doesn't matter who knows because God knows and he is our reward. When we're doing something just for the applause of men, we're not doing it. God is not honored by that. God is not pleased by that. We're doing it for our own selfish gain to say, look how nice I am. That doesn't point people to Christ at all. Pride will never let you be a servant Pride will keep score of anything that you have done for others versus what they have done in return. And it wants things to be equal. That's not how God works. Aren't you glad that God doesn't want equality from us? 
He says, I died on the cross for you. Now, what are you going to do for me? That's not his attitude because we could never repay that. This verse really hit home for me, even though I've read it dozens of times. The Lord spoke to me when I read this and made being a servant applicable. Okay. As most of you know, I am a wife. I'm a homeschool mom. Those are my top two earthly priorities. Being a godly wife, mom, and homemaker all require you to be a servant. You are constantly doing things for other people. And especially when those kids are little and they can't do anything for you. Besides keep you up all night um, and give you more laundry. So that is being a servant. That is where it starts for a lot of people. Because as, as a kid, as a teenager, as a college student, you're just in survival mode. Trying to take care of what needs to be done. Do your homework, do your classes, and go to work, right? So if you get to that point and you have that baby, you have that husband, that wife, and you don't choose to be a servant, things are going to be out of balance. Things are going to be chaos really quickly. You will begin to keep an account of how many times you've done laundry, how many times you've picked toys up off the floor and your spouse hasn't. That's not a place you want to be. This is miserable and this does not honor the Lord at all. Being a servant, think of think of the true meaning of a servant. They had no rights. They were treated as property. We're not living that way today, okay? To be a servant today, it's you're just doing it. You're doing it because it needs to be done. You're doing it because this is where God has you. And this is something I try to teach my kids. You see a need, you feel a need. It's not, well, I did it last time. It's her turn. It's not how it works. I want them to, it's my job to teach them to share the chores. But you saw, you know, the laundry basket was full. Um, go start laundry. Not, well, I did it last time. It's his turn. Go start laundry. Okay. Don't, don't worry about that. Um, It'll balance. So, when you think of the true meaning of this, how we would think of it as a slave in master days, that slave didn't say, well, I I did, you know, X amount of, I did, I, you know, I did whatever the thing is, X amount of things yesterday. I worked so many hours yesterday, so I don't have to do that today. Let somebody else do it. No, they just did it. It was expected of them to work and do whatever their master said without arguing, without talking back, without comparing themselves to what the slave next to them did. That's how we're supposed to live. Not focus on what everybody else is or is not doing. You let the Lord take care of that. He sees. He knows. Just do it. The things that we are called to do, doing the laundry, doing the dishes, making the meals, cleaning the house, mopping the floor, that's worship to the Lord. When we stop looking at it as worship, it's just another task. It's another thing we have to get done. And it's not fair that I have to do this again. Paul never said that. Paul said, it's not fair that I've been beaten again for nothing. Paul didn't say, it's not fair that I'm in prison again for something I didn't do. Something that's not an offense. I'm a Roman citizen for crying out loud. Like, I'm not supposed to be in jail. Instead, Paul said, I'm in jail. I'm going to sing praises at midnight. I'm going to write this letter to the Philippians and show them that their joy can be full all the time because mine is, and I know that because of the Lord. That's what Paul did. He didn't say, this is unfair. He said, what can I do for God where I'm at with what I've been given? That's what we're supposed to do. And if that means changing diapers, then that means changing diapers. That's what we are called to do. I'm not saying that everyone must find joy in cleaning in order to be a good godly woman. You don't. But you can do them joyfully as unto the Lord. You can do them with a good attitude. I'm also a waitress three nights a week. This is the definition of being a servant. Um, I am a server. That is what I am supposed to do. If I were to walk up to a table with a bad attitude, no smile, negative body language, I would not be a good server, nor would I be employed very long. The same applies to your home and your ministry. God is not glorified through our resentfulness ever. He can work 
through it and still bless others and teach them things and he can work on your heart. But that is not an attitude that glorifies him and tells others, yes, you are welcome in my home. Let me minister to you. Nobody wants to be around someone like that. Anytime a guest asks for something, it's my job to get it for them. Doing this in a huff will not provide a pleasant experience for the guest during their meal, nor will it provide me with a tip when they leave. And that's kind of what I'm betting on are those tips because we make $2 an hour. So I need that. I need to treat them kindly to encourage them to do that, right? If you do these things in your home, you huff, you stomp through the house, you slam doors. That's not providing a pleasant experience. That is not teaching them what it means to be a servant. It's not teaching them to do things that you don't want to do, even with a you know, even though you have to, to do it with a godly attitude. This is not provoking others to serve the Lord. It's going to make your kids count down the days to when they can get out of your house. And that's not a place that we're supposed to live at all. Too often we want to be asked to do big things for the Lord. We want to teach a Sunday school class. We want to lead the music. We want others to see what we're doing. But we're not willing to serve in our own homes or the local churches we should. If you are not willing to scrub toilets, you don't get to teach a Sunday school class. You're not there. You're not ready. God hasn't given you that position because you can't do the small things. We must be faithful to the little things before we can be trusted with the big things. Paul was called to this position of being an apostle and he took it very seriously. Paul did not allow himself to be distracted by things that did not matter or by things that did not further the gospel. We must remember that even good things can distract us from what God has called us to do. We do not have to be involved in every ministry, outreach, program, trend, kids, sports, team, club, etc. Yes, those things can be great, but we are not expected to do everything all the time. If your ministry is getting in the way of how you serve your family, it's time to reevaluate where you spend your time and energy. And I will, this is a hill that I will die on. If your kid's sports is keeping you out of church, you need to reevaluate where you spend your time and your energy. I'm all for sports. That's a good thing. Um, not the expense of church and of your walk with God. If your kid's ballet, piano, dance, whatever it is, keeps you from church, it's, it's time to reevaluate. Paul was separated from his old life and unto the gospel. We could go on forever here, but the point is, is that leaving your old life, your hobbies, and your sins behind should be the beginning of the Christian life, not the end. We are to be separated from the world, separated from sin, but we have to be separated unto something, or we're right back to the things that we just left. Paul was separated unto the gospel, unto Christ. He left his position as a persecutor and a Pharisee, but he did not leave his zeal. He took that with him and used it for Christ. Paul served willingly. He didn't complain because of what he had to do at all. Paul was a tent maker. Like that was a skill that he had that he still used and was able to become friends with um, Aquila and Priscilla, I believe it was, and was able to have an influence with them and with the church. He went wherever God led preached the gospel to any audience he had and addressed any issues in the church that needed it because he was convinced that that's what needed for the gospel to go forward because that's what God told him to do. God said, hey, address this. Hey, you know, we need to get back to you. You need to get back to your first love, all of that. Um, so he did it. That was a hard thing to publicly address a problem or sin in the church, but Paul did it because he wanted to be right with God. He wanted those people to be right with God. His focus was on the big picture of serving Christ through serving people. Paul had the view that serving God was a privilege, and he wanted to do all he could in the time he had. He only had one life to live, and he knew that. And he spent the first part of it a Pharisee persecuting the church. He had a lot to do. He wanted to do his best for Christ. At the moment of his conversion, Paul lost his job, his status, and his friends. He gave up everything for Jesus, and he was happy to do it. He spent his life encouraging others and pointing them to Jesus. He taught by example, and we must do the same. Don't just say what scripture says. Live it like you believe it. Are you doing what God has called you to do? Hopefully you can say yes. But are you doing it willingly and joyfully? Are you willing to do it sacrificially? What are you willing to give up to do what God has called you to do? Serving is meeting the needs of others. 
It's helping them. It's doing things for them. It's not always enjoyable, convenient, or easy at all. This is probably harder for you if your love language is not acts of service, and that's okay. You just have to be aware of that and ask the Lord to help you. Ask him to grow you in this area. This stems from a love of people. Paul loved people. He saw them as God saw them, as souls created by the God of heaven who had an eternity to spend somewhere, and he wanted that place to be heaven. Paul was able to live this way because he had full faith and confidence in the gospel. He knew he was not wasting his time and energy. Romans 1, verses 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. We often don't share Jesus like we should because we have a weak faith. We will never share something that we are not fully convinced in. Too often we are ready to defend our political stance, our stance on abortion, our stance on homosexuality, our stance on alcohol, whatever the hot topic is of the day, like everyone has an opinion, right? But we try to leave Jesus out of it. We just say it's not right. We say like it's we talk about alcohol and all the things that could go wrong and people that have died from alcohol, all the things. But to give a verse, to say, I don't want you to do this because I love you, because God loves you, because he wants you to go to heaven. We skirt around that issue. That should be our number one reason. is because the Bible says, and God loves you. That's it. When we love people, we want them to go to heaven with us. Our job is to make heaven crowded. And we're not doing it because we don't even want to say his name in public. We often get overwhelmed because we feel like we are in the minority. And we are. Conservative Christians are in the minority. Um, but it doesn't mean we need to be quiet. It doesn't mean we need to stop loving people. It doesn't mean we just need to sit here and keep to ourselves. And it'll all work out in the end. Everyone will get there. No, they won't. Heaven has to be real, which means hell has to be real. means hell has to be real to us too. That is when we will start seeing people as souls that are loved by God that could spend eternity in hell and torture without him if they don't come to him to know the truth. It is our job to be a servant, to take Christ with us wherever we go and tell people that God loves them. Until next time, stay in the word, stay close to the shepherd, and let him lead you in paths of righteousness.